Masechet Baba Batra, Daf Samech Dalid. We have a follow-up from the Suga um, from yesterday, and then we're going to see a new Mishnah. In the Suga yesterday, we saw the opinion of Rav Dimi, who says there are three levels depending on what language one uses in a deed. If one says, I'm just selling you this uh, residence, then they only get the first floor of that residence and not the attic and not the basement. If he adds in the deed, umka and ruma, the depth and the height, then that does include the basement and the attic, uh, gets sold, but it will not include the cisterns. But if he writes, umka viruma, if he writes, um, uh, all the way down to the depth of the earth and up to the height of the sky, then that includes also the cistern. So that was David Avdimi that said three levels, but there is another opinion that said, no, it could be only two levels. If you say nothing at all, then you get the first floor and the attic and the basement. And if you add just umkaviruma, then you get the cistern also. And there's no need to add uh, up to the sky and all the way down to the earth. So we're going to ask a question on each of these opinions. First, Tashema. The Mishnah earlier says that um, if I sell you a house and I just say bayit, then the rooftop is not included if the roof has a fence that's ten tefachim high around it. Then it's considered its own area, and I sold you the residence. I did not sell you the roof, and I, the seller, get to keep the rights to the roof. And now we ask, If you follow the opinion that when you add no phrases to the deed, you just say, I'm selling you a house, that does include the basement and the attic, well then, even if it has a fence with ten tevachim, so what? You just said it includes ruma, even if you don't say anything. So therefore, the rooftop should go forth in in the sale. It should be assumed and included in the sale. So the Mishnah seems to contradict this view. And we answer, which is really the Peshat of the Mishnah, Since the has a fence that's ten tevachim high, that makes it significant in its own right. So in other words, even according to this opinion, when you say, uh, even when you don't say anything, it does include the, uh, the, the second floor and the basement. I mean, that would be like a second floor that's within the house, an attic area uh, that's built into the house. It would include that. It would also include a rooftop space if it did not have a fence or it had a low fence because that's not uh, considered a significant area in and of itself if it's not fenced in. So yes, it would include that automatically even without any extra words. However, if it has a fence that's ten tefachim high, then that becomes a significant uh, area in its own right, a separate thing. And it's not included without saying any further specification. It's not included in the sale. So we answered that question. And now we're going to ask a question on the other way. We saw yesterday that Resh Lakish says, according to this, Zot Omeret, this was following up on the law that if a Levi sells property to someone else, to a non-Levi, they can stipulate and say, I'm selling this land to you on condition that you will give me the Ma'aser Rishon, the tenth all goes to me. And the Gemara asks, well, how is that effective? Because it's Tavashelo Ba'ala Olam. The next grain of next year doesn't yet exist. And it answers, oh, since he said this condition, it can't be that he said the condition for naught. People don't say things, just words that won't have any effect. And therefore, we add on to his intention. And the only way for this condition to work is if he actually keeps for himself, the seller, the levy seller, if he keeps for himself part of the land. The land, wherever that ma'asid will grow, he's actually keeping the right to that land. And so we see from here that when someone says something, we interpret it in a way that will be uh, legally significant, even if that means we have to add on uh, some interpretive statement to it. So Deshakish says, according to that, I am going to derive another similar law that if someone sells a home to his friend and he said, on con- I'm selling you this home on condition that the upper story is mine, the upper story is his. Now, uh, that seems to be obvious. He made a condition, the upper story is mine. So what is he adding to this? 
Um, so uh, Resh Lakish says, oh, he's adding something. Now we had to clarify what Resh Lakish meant because he didn't really say what else is added on ex- besides the uh, explicit condition. So what is this coming to add? Rav Zavid says it's coming to add that if he wants the seller, since he said this statement, he not only can he use that uh, second floor, the upper story, he can also, or, or rooftop, whatever is there, he can also stick things out, projections, he could stick it from the roof out into the courtyard of the buyer, even though that's taking up some of the airspace, that's included as well. So how does he know that? Because um, the seller uh, actually wouldn't have to say this condition. The seller automatically keeps the upper story, it keeps the rooftop. That's what we said uh, um, in the Mishnah. And therefore, by him saying, oh, uh, on condition that I keep the upper story, since that he would get that anyway, the condition must have legal significance. He wouldn't say it's worse for nothing. And therefore, must come to, coming to include something else. What does it include? Rav Zavid says it includes these projections. Good, that makes sense. Rav Papa, however, Amad, she'im not ali al gaba boneh. Now, Papa says if he wants to build a, an upper story on it, he can build. Let's say there's nothing there. Uh, there's a, a rooftop. And he says, on condition that I have the second story, so he can build a second story on it. Now, here's the question. If you think that by saying nothing, you get only the first floor, that was Rav Dimi's position. So we're asking a question on him. So since you said, or assuming, uh, in the case where you said nothing, you don't get the upper story. So then, what do I need this Almenat for? Uh, after all, even if you don't say Almenat, the seller uh, keeps the upper story. Now, what are you adding? You're adding, uh, what, the right to build on the upper story? That's already included. In other words, even if you just say no, nothing, no condition, just say, I'm selling you this residence. All the buyer gets is the first floor, and the seller keeps the rights to the rooftop, and he can build on, on the rooftop. So that's already included, and therefore, these added words aren't adding anything. So then, what does a shakish mean, according to that, that he says, oh, you can build, you can, uh, uh, build a second floor on it. I know that already. And so the answer is, this, on, this condition teaches that even if that second story falls down, the seller can rebuild it. I might have thought, okay, listen, if I'm selling you the second, if I'm selling you the bait, you get the first story, I get the second story. Okay, fine. If it's already there, I can keep the second story because it's already, already exists. But I might have thought that if it fall once it falls down, then that's it. There's not it's gone. It's not not there anymore. And then I cannot. You might have thought that I cannot rebuild it. I don't have a right to do so, because I'm building it on top of your house. If you own a house, a one story house, can I just come and build a second story on top of it? I'm not allowed to do that. Um, and so I might have thought only if it's already there, then I can keep it. Uh, but once it falls down, it's not there, then I could not rebuild it. And that's why you have to say this condition, if you want the right to rebuild it, that's what Papa meant. He wasn't talking about using the second story that's already there. That is obvious and is included in, in, the, in the no language. You don't need a con- special condition for that. That This condition adds, does add something, and Rosh Lakish is therefore properly learning from the Levi case, just like in the Levi case. The words themselves don't have legal significance, but you have to do an add-on that he owns the land also. So to here, we add on another right that is um, that would not otherwise be included, and that's the right to rebuild. Next Mishnah. We already referenced this Mishnah earlier, but here it is. If I sell you a bait, then you get only the house and you do not get the pit or the cistern. We'll see the difference between these two. And even if I write in the deed that you get the house, its depth and its height, the depth and the height, no, that only refers to the basement and the upper story living space. It does not include the cistern and the pit, which are not used for living space, but rather for water storage. So it's a different usage and therefore is not included unless you specify uh, further that it would be included. So now I'm the seller. I sold you the house and I keep the cistern. That's what we just said. Rebbe Akiba adds that when I want to come and use the cistern, I'm going to have to walk on you, the buyer's land, to get to the cistern, because the cistern is there, 
under the house or near the house. So how am I going to get there? I'm going to have to walk on your land. But I sold you. I sold you the land and I sold you the house. I can't just barge into the house and go downstairs and use the cistern. So therefore, I have to buy back a pathway, a right to go into the cistern. That's the, that's the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. Chachamim say, no, I am the seller, I'm selling you the house, and I'm keeping, uh, um, if I don't say anything, even if I do say, I'm kavruma, I am keeping for myself the cistern. Now the cistern is under the house. So now since I'm keeping the cistern, Chachamim say, I don't have to buy a special pathway through it. It's assumed that when I sold you the house and I kept the cistern, that I have to have a way of accessing the cistern. So, um, include uh, uh, um, implicit within the sale is that I'm keep, keeping for myself not only the cistern but also a pathway. But the Biakibas says no. I sold you the house. I sold you the whole house and the rights to enter the house, and I don't have that anymore. And therefore, I'm going to have to negotiate a deal afterwards and say, listen, you know, how about uh, you know ten dollars a month just to go into the house to get some water? I'll have to buy that right. Mishnah continues. Rabbi Akiva agrees that if I make it explicit in the sale, I say, listen, I'm selling you the house, but except for the cistern. I actually say it. And now I don't have to say it to exclude the cistern. We just said in Stam, saying nothing, I keep the cistern. Um, but then I would have to buy a path. But if I say, I'm selling you the house except for the cistern. Since I said it explicitly, then we assume that I am keeping also a pathway to get to the cistern. Then I don't have to buy uh, from you another pathway to back your agrees in that case. Now we have the opposite case. Mecharan le'acher. Let's say I am selling you um, just the cistern and not the house. Beforehand, I was, I was selling the house and keeping the cistern. Now I'm keeping the house. I'm just selling you the cistern. How about then? You need a pathway to get to it. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Eno Sarich Likach Lo Derech. Here, Rabbi Akiva is the opposite of what he said before. Here, the buyer, that's you, you do not have to buy a pathway. I, since I sold you the cistern, we assume that I'm also selling you a pathway to it. Hachamim Omerim Sarich Likach Lo Derech. Hachamim say, I, I sold you the cistern. Look, the deed says only cistern. It doesn't say a pathway, right? So go fly, make a, a big leap and uh, get to the cistern uh, somehow. Oh, you want to walk through my land? Then you have to buy a right of a pathway through my land. So Chachamim is here the opposite of what they said in the previous case. So we'll have to explain what's the principle of Rabbi Akiva and Chachamim uh, uh, by which we can uh, explain both of their opinions and be consistent. We'll get to that in a minute. First, Yateb Rabina Bekakashiale. Hainu Bor, Hainu Dut. Ravina was sitting and studying this Mishnah, and he had a problem. A board and a dut are the same thing. A pit and a cistern, they're both holes in the ground that store water. Why does Mishnah have to say both? And so Rabba Tosfa'a tells Ravina, I have a solution from a baraita that says um, a, a pit and a cistern are both in the ground, they're both, hole, both holes in the ground, except that a pit, you just dig in the ground, loose dirt, and that's it. You just just a regular plain old hole in the ground. Whereas a cistern, you have to is you do masonry work. You dig a hole and then you put bricks um, uh, in, uh, on the ground all around to make a wall. And you'll put plaster also, and that way it'll keep the the water that flows in there nice and fresh. They'd have an aqueduct system, and the, whenever it rained, it would go and collect and go into channels and fill up the cistern. And since it's made out it's made out of a, a building uh, material. Therefore, it's nice and strong and will uh, hold the water better than a simple pit that uh, is, uh, will, will, uh, will you know, lose the water and won't last as well, but it's cheaper to make. So, but, so these, uh, they are, in fact, different. We have the very same explanation repeated again in someone else's name. Yativ Ravashe v'kakashi ala hainu bor hainu dut. Ravashe was sitting and studying this Mishnah, and he also had this same question. Uh, Ravina and Ravashe are more or less contemporaries, although there's uh, more than one Ravina. 
Bina. But assuming it's the same, so they independently had this problem. Hainu bar va hainu do it and do the same thing. Why does Mishnah say it twice? Amale mor kashisha bere de rav chista de rav ashe at hashema de tanya hechada bor ve hechada dut bakarka elasha bor ve hafira ve hadut be binyan. And so mor kakisha mor kashisha the son of rav ashe told rav ashe, I can answer you from a beraita the very same thing. It's interesting that a question about a doubling in the Mishnah is itself this whole suga is doubled. Um, but it says the same thing. The Baraita says that a pit and a cistern are both holes in the ground, except that a pit is just lo- digging loose dirt, whereas a cistern is built with masonry walls. And so the Mishnah has to include both because there is, in fact, a reason why you might say one or not the other. A pit, on the one hand, is less significant. It's not such a significant thing on its own. You might think it's just included in the sale, um, uh, while a, uh, um, a cistern, that's a, a, a special built thing with bricks and everything, is a separate entity. And you might have thought the other way around, that a cistern that's built with bricks, so that's built with bricks like the house is built with bricks. So maybe it's a part of a building and it's considered sold, whereas a pit is not built with bricks, so it's a separate thing. So there's a, a reason to think both, but in the bottom line, since both of them are used not for residence, I'm selling you a residence, but rather used for a different purpose of storing water, therefore they are not included in a standard sale, even if you write um kaveduma, they are also not included. Now, if I sell you the house and I keep the cistern for myself, Rabbi Akiba says that I, the seller, have to also buy a path. Hachamim say, no, I don't have to buy a path. Just like I kept the cistern for myself, I also kept the right to walk through the land also for myself. So what's at the essence of their machloket? First, we'll explain the Resha, and then we're going to bring in the Sefa also, and we're also going to bring yet another Mishnah as well to see how everything is consistent. So maybe Rabbi Akiba, what's the essence of the Machlok? Rabbi Akiba says, when someone sells something, he sells generously. So if I'm selling you the house, I'm selling you the whole house and all the rights to the house, including the right to walk into the house. Even though the cistern is in the, under the house, I'm selling you in a generous way. And therefore, I'm going to have to buy back the path. Whereas the rabbis say that in general, someone who sells, sells in a stingy way. I'm going to sell you, but at the minimum amount that you can fit into the words of the deed of the sale. I said a house, I'm only selling you the house, a living space, but of course I'm keeping for myself as much as I can. And since I'm keeping for myself the cistern, then I'm keeping for myself also the pathway. And this explanation would make sense because elsewhere we also say, oh, Rabbi Akiba follows his same line of reasoning because Rabbi Akiba says that someone who sells, sells in a generous way. And we can derive that actually from here. Maybe this is the very source for what we say because we we always quote Rabbi Akiba saying that a seller is generous. And so this would fit in line with that. Maybe this is even the source of where we say, oh, Rabbi Akiba is following what he says here. So this would make sense and would explain everything. But then we say, maybe not. Maybe the Akiba is different. He's not. He's not, it's not because of the psychology of all sellers that they're always generous. Maybe it's in fact um, about the psychology of the buyer. A buyer is paying good money for to buy this land, and a buyer is not going to want to give over money and then have other people go trade on his property. Right? I'm selling it to you. You paid me good a hundred thousand dollars. You paid me good money, and now the next day I'm going to start barging onto your property to get to the cistern. No buyer would accept that, and since the buyer wouldn't accept that, then we have to. Assume Assume that the seller is agreeing to that condition, and that's why the seller has to buy a, a pathway afterwards from the buyer, and uh, that would be the opinion of Rabbi Akiba. Whereas, Rabbanan says, no, let's look at the psychology of the seller. Nobody would want to take uh, to take money and have to uh, uh, have to fly in the air in other words the seller doesn't want to receive money to sell his house and now okay I saw I sold you the house I got the money but I kept the cistern and now I gave away the house I have to fly in the air to get 
to my cistern, that's a, a, a nonsense. If I know that I'm keeping the cistern, then I, the seller, and the seller, is, uh, the seller has to agree to, to sell something in order for it to go there, and this, no seller would agree to sell the uh, pathway uh, of the cistern and keep the cistern and have to fly in the air. So maybe that's the machloka. Do we focus on the rights and the needs of the buyer? That would be the Rebekiba, and a banan is focusing on what the seller would uh, possibly agree to. And he would agree to, he would not agree to give away the pathway, and therefore he does not have to buy the pathway. So maybe that's the essence of their machloket, and it's not about what a seller always does, that he's always generous, or the banan would say he's, that he's always stingy. Okay, so you know what? Let's look at the continuation of the Mishnah, and uh, we'll bring back the Ayin Yafa, Ayin Ra'a idea. In the Sefa says that if I sell you the pit, in this case, I'm keeping the house for myself and selling you only the cistern. And there, the Biakiba says that um, I do, uh, the, the buyer does not have to buy a path that's included in the sale. We assume it's included. Hachamim say that he has to buy a path. So over here, we can, if we use the Ayin Ra Toba uh, uh, model, then that works for here also, because here I am the seller. According to the Biakiba, a person, a seller is always generous. I'm selling you the cistern, so we assume I'm generous. I'm selling you the cistern, and of course, it includes a pathway, and therefore the buyer does not have to buy a pathway. Whereas the Chamim think that a seller is generally stingy. And I, the seller could say, I only sold you a cistern. I didn't sell you a pathway, and therefore you have to buy the pathway. So you see that this explanation of Ayn Tov Ayn Ra'a explains equally the Resha and equally the Sefa. So you see, this works better, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the, the previous explanation would not work as well. So uh, maybe that's a good explanation, but we reject this too. Dilma Bahai Pelige de Rebi Akiva Maybe Rabbi Akiva's reasoning is that we always follow the mind of the buyer. What's the buyer thinking? In the Resha of the Mishnah, when I'm keeping the, uh, the cistern for myself, so then we say the buyer would think to himself, oh, I'm paying all this money, and then I have to let people uh, tread in. So that's why there, Rabbi Akiva says, I have to buy back a right to the, to, to, to the pathway, because we're considering the opinion of the buyer. In the Sefa, where the buyer is the one uh, um, buying the cistern, so then we also consider the viewpoint of the buyer, and he says, I'm paying money for the cistern. Don't I have to get a path also? So the Biakiba says, we always follow the view of the buyer, whereas the rabbis say, we always follow the uh, view, the intention of the seller. And so in the Resha, the seller is keeping the cistern for himself, so he's thinking to himself, of course I want a pathway. That's why he keeps it for himself. And in the Sefa, when uh, the seller is selling the cistern, so then the seller is going to think to himself, why should I uh, give him a pathway and have him barge into my house? I'm only selling him the, the cistern, and that's why Chachamim say that in the Sefa, the buyer has to buy it. So maybe it's not about the general uh, psychology of all sellers that are always stingy or always not, but rather it's do we focus on the, the, the intentions of the buyer or the intentions of the seller. That uh, could equally explain the, the, uh, the both parts of the Mishnah. So instead, we're going to bring another Mishnah from later on in the Masechet. This later Mishnah is very similar to the Mishnah that we just read, except that it's in the context of a field rather than in a house. And so it says, if I sell you a field, and I say I'm selling you a field and everything in it, that does not include a cistern, nor a wine press that would could be in a field, uh, nor a dove coat. Right here's a, a dove coat that you build so that doves will come and uh, and, and nest there, and then you can uh, have to take their eggs and take the doves. Um, whether they are abandoned or whether they're currently utilized, these are considered separate uh, items. And when I say field, I mean the the land that's uh, the plantable area of the field, and I do not intend the 
these uh, separate structures that are for used for different things, using for used for storing water um, or for uh, making wine uh, or for doves. So these are separate items not included in the sale. Good. We understand that part. Now, Rabbi Akiba says that if I sell you the field and I, therefore I'm keeping for myself the cistern in the field, I have to buy back from you a pathway through the field, right? Just like in the previous Mishnah says that if there's a cistern inside the house, in the basement of the house, I have to buy from you a way, a pathway to get into the house and come down into the basement and take water. Uh, here, when it's in the field, I have to buy from you that right to walk through your field. Hacham say, no, I don't have to. Um, I sold you the field, but I kept the cistern, and by keeping the cistern, we also assume that I'm keeping a pathway through the cistern. Okay, so now we call the sefa, and now we're going to show what the proof is. Ha tu la mali. Why do I need this whole Mishnah? Isn't it the same principle as in the first Mishnah? I got the point. If I sell you one item for one usage, the other things that are significant things for different usages are not included. Why do I need this? Ela lav hakamashmalan, terebiakibas so maybe the Mishnah includes both of these Mishnayot, both about the house and about the field. This extra Mishnah is coming to teach us this very principle that we're trying to prove. That according to the Biakiva, sellers always sell generously. And according to the Banan, sellers are always stingy. And so, so even though if I had only the first Mishnah, I could have interpreted it in a more local way. That is just about the intent, the psychology of, of sellers versus buyers. This extra Mishnah is coming to teach us that it's actually a general principle about the generosity or stinginess of all sellers. Okay, so that's a possibility, but we reject this again. No, maybe the previous Mishnah taught us the law regarding a house, and this Mishnah is us, teaching us this very same law regarding the field. And I actually do need them both, because if I only had the previous Mishnah regarding the house, I would say that there, um, because of privacy, that's why the buyer uh, get the, uh, um, does not. We do not assume that the buyer is going to give me a right to barge into his house where he has privacy, right? So that case was. I sell you the house, I keep for myself the cistern. Now, uh, so there, the Biakiba has to say that I have to buy back a uh, right to go into the house because I can't barge in, you can't assume I'm going to barge in, into your house for that. Nobody would, would pay money to buy a house just to have the previous owner come in and out anytime he wants. So there, um, the Biakiba had to teach me that the seller has to buy back a right to go into the house. However, regarding a field, I would say no, not so. In a field, there's no, uh, you don't have privacy rights. People can walk through a field um, and uh, the seller would certainly not care as much as going into his house. So regarding the field, I might have thought that Rabbi Akiva would say, oh, if, the, if I'm selling you a field and therefore, and, and I said only field, and therefore I keep for myself the cistern, then I do not have to buy a right because the seller wouldn't mind. He would be fine to pay money for a field and he wouldn't mind if I come in and out and get water from the cistern. So that's why I certainly need the second Mishnah. And if I had only the second Mishnah, I would say that's in that case, Rabbi Akiva says, I have to buy back a right to walk into your field because there is detrimental to the field. If you have fresh plants, fresh uh, grain growing, and I go walk and stomp over them, it will cause damage to those plants. And so in that case, uh, normally a, a buyer would say, I paid you good money. I don't want you stepping on my plants. And that's where the Biakiva would say, I, the seller, have to buy back a right to it. However, in a house, maybe the seller, maybe the, the buyer wouldn't care. So buy, if, if people come go in and out of houses and doesn't destroy anything, there's no loss to the buyer. Fine, you want to come into the house? and get water, right? He wouldn't care. And I might have thought that Rabbi Akiva would say, in the case of a house, they, since I'm keeping the cistern, then I am keeping a, uh, the pathway to it, and I don't have to buy it back. And that's why I need the first Mishnah. So in fact, I do need both Mishnayot for the, the laws in and of themselves, and we can still go by the more local explanation of the psychology that, uh, that buyers um, wouldn't want to give money and uh, pay, pay good money and then have someone either enter into the privacy of their home or stomp on their plants. And so I need to teach me both of these to teach me that 
buyers um, would care and therefore in both cases the seller has to buy back a pathway so I need both of these Mishnayot in order to teach me this I have no extra Mishnah to teach me a more general psychology about all sellers and so therefore uh, we, we, we we still don't have a proof that according to the Biakiba um, everybody is a uh, is general all sellers are generous but we finally will have a proof from the Sefa the continuation of that Mishnah on Daf in Aleph that we just quoted the first half of regarding a field. If I own a cistern and a field and a cistern's in the field and this time I'm selling to you only the cistern and I'm keeping the field for myself. In that case Rabbi Akiva says that the buyer does not have to acquire a pathway. We assume that if I'm selling you the cistern then I'm selling you a pathway as well. And Chachamim say, no, I have to. I sold you the cistern. And I say, no, I only sold you the cistern. You want a pathway also? Then that will cost you extra. So Hatu Lamali, why do I need the Sefa also? Hainu Hach, it's the very exact, it's the exact same case as in the previous Mishnah regarding a house. It's the, it's the same principle. So I wouldn't need this also. Rather, we finally do have an extra clause that is here to teach us this uh, this more general principle that according to the Biakiba, a seller sells generously, and according to the Banan, a seller we assume sells sells stingily, and that's why in this case, as in all the others, this one principle can can fit all these cases, and this extra one says that we can even learn this more general principle that the uh, seller, uh, according to the Biakiba, is generous. So if I sold you a cistern in a field or in a house, then I am selling you also the pathway. You don't have to buy. Your own pathway and according to Chachamim when I'm selling you the cistern in the field or in the house it's only that and in order to get to it you have to pay extra for the pathway Baruch Adonai Le'olam Amen Amen.